So for real uh, airplanes, there are remarkable three-dimensional effects. So this is uh, one of the pictures taken in the wind tunnel of uh, a, a testing done in NASA Langley. That's a blended wind body airplane model and at pretty high angles of attack. And good luck in explaining this picture, which is like all the streams of the oil flow with our two-dimensional theories of the boundary layer. And whenever you see oil flow visualization, the oil flow, the oil, lives on the surface of the model. So whichever direction the oil goes is determined by what? The shear stress, yes. Or the velocity closest to the wall, right? And uh, what you see here is actually remarkably different from an uh, inviscid flow or even just the flow outside the boundary layer for these uh, for the same model, right? So, and we're going to be looking at boundary layers that are under significant pressure gradient in the transverse direction, and also boundary layers under significant divergence or convergence of streamlines, which is really happening everywhere here. So first let's establish the notation or the general physical framework of our analysis. So we start by looking at the, uh, the variation of the velocity direction inside the boundary layer. So let's say this QE is basically now a vector. QE is a vector that has two components. So here X and Z are an arbitrary orthogonal coordinate system that lives on the surface. And by the way, it's, it's generally not possible to have a global coordinate system like XZ that is orthogonal everywhere, right, on a curved surface. So, so there, are, there are places where you can do that for basically all the surface, like if you have a sphere, right? You can define x and z coordinates like uh, uh, longitudinal and latitudinal surface, uh, directions that is orthogonal everywhere, but that's not true for any surfaces. Basically, you can, you can have surfaces where globally you cannot have this kind of x and z, but locally, if you take a small patch on the surface, you can always do that. And because the, make, if you want to do computation, then it's important to analyze cases where you cannot have these global coordinates. But if you're just talking about the physics, we can always assume locally we have these uh, orthogonal coordinate surfaces. And when you do things computationally, you have to do this transformation. And uh, uh, basically, it's a manipulation with the PDEs you, you derive. But here, let's focus on deriving these equations that describe the physics. So we assume there is an x and z coordinates lives on the surface that are orthogonal. And this QE is basically a vector that contains the UEx and UEz. So this QE is basically the component of the velocity tangential to the surface. And this QE serves as the same purpose as our UE in our two-dimensional analysis, right? Because when we talk about UE, we are only talking about the tangential velocity. We basically thrown away, we have thrown away the vertical velocity V, right? And all our normalization has been using UE. So here, this QE is a vector that contains the uh, surface tangential component of the outside velocity. Now this serves as, uh, as our UE in the three-dimensional case. Now if you project the velocity components inside the boundary layer into three different components, first of all, there is a V component. So V component is uh, consist considered separately in 3D boundary layers. So that is a separate quantity, just like the V in our 2D boundary layer. But the two directions tangential to the surface is lumped together into a Q. So Q is our UX and UZ inside the boundary layer. Okay, so now whenever we talk about the vector Q, it's like our U in the 2D boundary layer. That's separate from the V. Uh, 
I mean, the reason is that this ux, uz have different scales as the v, right? Remember our thin layer assumption? That uh, basically our thin layer assumption requires that ux and uz is much, much greater than than uh, than v, let's say, than our ui, which is we define as v, right? And uh, uh, so let's actually let's so so let's actually call them uh, um, let's actually call them u e and w e just a w e so that like uh, we we still use uh, u v and w to denote the x y and z direction velocities so let's call this this q as u and w. And our v is the y directional velocity, and the assumption is u and w is much much greater than v. Plus another assumption we have is partial partial y. The y directional rate of change is much much greater than partial partial x. That's our our old assumption. Here in three D boundary layers, we also assume that partial partial y is also much much greater than partial partial z. So any variation uh, that you can find when you move along the surface is much, much less than the variation you can find when you go away from the wall, right? That's basically due to the, the variation orthogonal to the wall is due to viscosity, and the variation in the other directions are due to other effects. <coughs> Sorry. OK. <coughs> Sorry. Okay, so now what you find here is that the velocity inside the boundary layer does not have to be in the same direction as the velocity outside the boundary layer. And particularly if you see the direction uh, of the velocity near the wall, it may go into a different direction than the velocity above the boundary layer. So over a very thin layer, you can find the direction of the flow to be varying with a finite angle. That is why when you see the oil flow on, on the top of a, a, a model, the oil flow direction can be remarkably different from the flow direction immediately outside the boundary layer. So, so that's the way you interpret the oil flow like this. You shouldn't automatically assume that um, the, for example, there is a the the flow outside the boundary layer is is in the same direction. Okay, maybe quite different. <laughs>